This is my last bit on touch. It is much shorter than the or the previous two. Um, I I know and I'm, I'm not sure how much I'm going to get to talking about pain today. Uh, I know we're getting behind. Uh, we're quite behind, and um, I think even from the updated schedule as far as material, and I keep reading things that are saying um, we really I need to let a lot more of this go. And it used to be when I had all of this at the end, we didn't get to touch and pain and taste and smell. So I'm going to have to decide what to let go. Uh, it already feels really rotten to me to be giving up movement and taking action in the world and depth and all of those things that we're going to give up for vision. But this is, and I know I'm rambling about what I'm, I, I really am uncomfortable um, not providing content, but this is already long. We're already getting towards an hour, and um, I think that's a lot of video watching, and it's a little bit different than sitting in a class for an hour and 15 minutes. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try and let some of this go. We're definitely gonna finish touch and pain. I might finish pain on Monday, and maybe start taste and decide what um, what I need to do as far as taking out some material. For perceiving objects, it's good to distinguish between active touch, where we're, we are exploring an object, usually with our fingers and hands, um, moving uh, our hands around haptically, and this kind of haptic perception of three-dimensional objects as we're exploring with our hand. We do explore, as I've already, already said, young kids, uh, toddlers, and so forth, explore more often with their tongue, but we might explore our food with our tongue. If you've ever um, walked on the beach and really kind of felt the sand between your toes and felt through that, you're, you're to some extent you are exploring the, the feeling of the sand, uh, we could call it that, but usually this is with our fingers and hands, and we distinguish that from a, a passive touch where someone's really touching something, applying something to our skin, and we talk about these kinds of touch really differently as, we, as we're doing an active touch, we usually talk about the object or that that um, sensation is belonging to the object, whereas with passive touch we usually say things like that feels sharp. We're talking about the perception and the feeling of this on our skin. Uh, I'm going to read the example from page 347. I usually have a student do this. Uh, this is these last um, chapters of the book, uh, touch and pain and taste and smell, is where I really feel like everything got the most interactive and was the most fun in my classes, which is one of the reasons I flipped all this around and uh, did the higher level vision later. But uh, I'm going to have to read this, uh, and I'm going to. This is um, uh, Girat Vermage, I'm not, I don't say his name right, who is uh, blind at the age of four from a childhood eye dis disease. And he is now uh, the Distinguished Professor of Marine Ecology and Paleoecology at UC Davis, the University of California, um, Davis. And he is being interviewed uh, for uh, Yale Graduate School uh, Biology Department, and he's blind. So these people don't think uh, much of him, or that he's, they don't think he could possibly, right, uh, succeed at Yale. So uh, here's what happened, as, um, as told by Vermage, 1997. Here's something, do you know what it is? Bell asked me as he handed me a specimen. My fingers and mind raced. Widely separated ribs parallel to outer lip. Large aperture, low spire, glossy. Ribs reflected backward. It's a harpa, I replied tentatively. It must be a harpa major. Right so far. How about this one? inquired Bell as another fine shell changed hands. Smooth, sleek, channeled suture, narrow opening. Could be any olive. It's an olive. I'm pretty sure it's Oliva Sayana, the common one from Florida, but they all look alike. Both men were momentarily speechless. They had planned this little exercise all along to call my bluff. Now that I had passed, Bell had undergone an instant metamorphosis. Beaming with enthusiasm and warmth, he promised me his full support. So again, they weren't thinking this blind guy was going to do very well um, in the biology department there, but showing with his haptic exploration and with his active touch that he could identify these shells. If you can imagine doing that, the specific shell, uh, I will tell you one of my 
one of my interactive uh, kind of, I don't want to call it a lab, but more of a demonstration is to have a smell lab. It's really a demonstration. And at the same time, a touch lab where you guys feel objects in paper bags where you can't use your eyesight and, and you're trying to dis decide what an object is based on just touch. And I do have a couple of shells in there and people usually say shell. And then I sometimes have someone say the whelk shell or the conch shell. And I do have an olive shell in there and people and some people get that. Uh, so we can do this. And I really I'm going to strongly recommend again that you go do these. You, you go do these kind of labs or demonstrations on your own. And so have somebody put a few objects into paper bags or somewhere where you cannot see them and just explore them with your hands and say to yourself, how am I how am I doing this? What is my um, what is my uh, strategy and my haptic exploration? And can I tell what the objects are? And you might decide to do that. So after going through a few of these slides and maybe thinking about all of these things. So we are using pretty much all of our systems together in a cooperative kind of way in order to do this haptic exploration, as it's called. Our sensory system, so we're detecting the cutaneous senses, the touch, the temperature, the texture. Um, our motor system as we're moving our fingers and hands around and the cognitive system that is taking in information about the what's coming in from the cutaneous senses about the sense sensations and putting that together with the, the motor system and deciding where to move the hands next and then how the hands move around uh, that kind of proprioception as well as being taken in so that we can figure out what an object is. Susan Lederman and Roberta Klatsky have done a couple of studies looking at these exploratory procedures or these haptic procedures, and they discovered that people tended to use a number of specific procedures. And so again, I usually try and make a pretty big deal about this. Um, and I usually ask a short answer question about it because we have done this uh, lab interaction, interactive kind of um, experiential thing where I try to get you all to really think. Have I used, and put this on the screen as you're, as you're doing it. Am I using lateral motion? Am I moving my hand back and forth across the top of something in order to figure out the texture? Am I using pressure, okay, to figure out the, the shape or the, really the buoyancy, what it feels like? Uh, am I using enclosure, which is much more clearly about figuring out the shape? Am I putting my hand around the entire object to get an idea of the shape? And am I doing this kind of contour following where I am moving my hand around the object to figure out both aspects of the shape and really about the, the texture of the outside of it as, as well? And usually people tell me that, that they did try those. Somebody, people give me specific examples of trying those with the different, um, different things. And um, I usually have stuffed animals and shells and, and different kinds of things in there that you are going to kind of use pressure and enclosure so that you are trying these different exploratory procedures, these different haptic procedures. And um, usually I have people tell me a couple of other things that they that they use. And one example is um, I have this weird, oddly shaped nut that um, people don't know quite what it is because it's really oddly shaped. Um, and so people tell me that they they ping it <laughs> to hear it. Uh, I can't think of other things that people have said, but so um, but these are the these are the basic haptic procedures that Ligerman and Klatsky found. And so you really do want to go through and just have a few things in a bag and and go through these three three slides in a row here and say um, how am I using these different um, systems together? The sensory system, cognitive system, and the motor system. How am I using these different procedures? And to remember that this is really an example of active touch. Okay, I'm going to do a little bit of the physiology, so um, which involves both the, res the responses of the mechanoreceptors as well as the cortical responses. Uh, in the thalamus and, and somatosensory, the primary somatosensory cortex and the um, frontal and parietal lobes. Uh, so if we look at the what's happening with the mechanoreceptors, and he, have, he gives this really nice example, and we kind of saw this with that bar with the raised pattern and how those vertical receptors responded, that the raised patterns that were more isolated 
had more activity in the Merkel receptors, we see the same kind of thing that if I have like a larger ball so that that ball is touching more of my finger, we're going to have this kind of um, shallower slope and less overall activity of the Mer that Merkel those main Merkel receptors in a ball and of all the Merkel receptors around it. But really, the main ones are we don't we don't have the same kind of slope and we don't have the same kind of activity in those uh, ones that are really feeling in the center. Whereas if we have a smaller ball, that's going to be touching fewer of the Merkel receptors. And what we're going to see is this real um, steep slope, okay, as the Merkel receptors that are responding are responding more strongly. Again, I know everybody really wanted to talk about receptive fields again. That is everybody's favorite topic. It's, it's not. And I have, I've kind of beat it into the ground because it's particularly important when, um, when we're looking at touch. So if you are interested in um, becoming a physical therapist or any, any kind of thing where you're dealing with people's um, bodies and a sense of touch or a sense of pain, these receptive fields are really important to understand. And we see I think very interestingly, although um, lateral inhibition is the only way for a sensory system to really work because we want to feel relative, uh, the information that's relative to the rest of the world, not absolute information, just like I said with vision. But we see these same kind of center surround receptive fields uh, with an excitatory center and an inhibitory surround. And he's showing that there on the monkey's arm. Um, so as we get a small object, and we just saw this with the ball that goes right and hits in the, that excitatory center, uh, we're going to have a lot of activity as that object gets a lot, a little bit larger and starts hitting some of those uh, receptive that that inhibitory surround. Um, we're going to see less activity. And this was measured in the ventral posterior nucleus of the thalamus. So here we're seeing in the thalamus, center surround receptive fields. Does that sound familiar? That should sound familiar. Lateral geniculate nucleus. <laughs> we're going to move out to the cortex, to the primary somatosensory cortex there, S1. Uh, we, we still see some with center surround receptive fields. We have others that respond to more specialized stimulation. Uh, so here's a neuron that responds to uh, uh, neuron 1 responds best to a horizontally oriented edge presented on the monkey's hand. So we're measuring from that area, that area of the homunculus that's feeling the monkey's um, upper palm there. And, it, and one of the neurons in there is gonna respond best to a horizontally oriented edge. It's not responding as we get farther and farther off of that horizontal, and it's not responding at all when we're getting to a vertical um, oriented edge. Does this remind you of something? This should remind you of something. So I have my green question, and so good. I am going to tell you the answer. Um, in neuron two, uh, we see that this neuron responds best when we, uh, so we're looking now at the monkey's tip of the finger. We have a neuron there that's in that part of the homunculus that responds best. This is the same with the palm, but just to the example, that is going to respond best to a stimulation that is moving in a particular direction across the finger. So if it's going um, up and to the, up and to the left, I'm going to feel that. I'm going to have the neural response. If it's going down to the right, I don't have the neural response. So this is reminds you of something. I'm hoping this reminds you of something. This should remind you, right, of simple cells and complex cells in the visual cortex that we talked about before, that the, those receptive fields of what the neurons are responding to. We see really similar uh, response in the primary somatosensory cortex. We also see in the primary somatosensory cortex in S1 uh, neurons that are going to respond uh, best when the monkey grasps a particular object and not as well when the monkey grabs different objects. And so in this case, um, we, when that, we have that kind of sharp edge of a ruler, that neuron responds. Uh, and when we put something that's more rounded, like a cylinder in the monkey's paw, uh, that neuron does not respond. And finally, also similar to vision and um, what we would see, for, what we see for hearing, is that um, cortical neurons are affected by 
attention, right? We have to be paying attention to something to have uh, much of a conscious experience of it. So what they did with the monkey was they either had a task where uh, the tactile uh, information was important for the task, which is the red line, or they had the monkey, the, the tactile information was in the hand, but the monkey was doing uh, some kind of visually oriented task. So the attention was to the visual task. And what we see is the red line showing us neural response. We see a high firing rate to um, when the monkey is actually paying attention to, for the task, the tactile information. But even though that tactile information is hitting the, the paw or wherever on the monkey, um, if the monkey is doing a visual task and not paying attention to what's happening uh, tactilely, um, then we don't see so much neural response. So I usually am not very good at remembering to have my summary slides, but I do with um, the videos really want to say bye somehow and have a good day and what I usually say at the end of a class. And it, it feels really weird, but um, for my summary slide, I'll just go ahead and say uh, really generally some of the things we've talked about. We've talked about our sensory receptors as we usually do. In this case, it's those all those four different mechanoreceptors. Uh, we talked about we talked more um, distinctly about the pathways to the brain, that medial lumniscal pathway. In this case, we'll talk about the spinothalamic pathway on on Monday when we talk about pain. Uh, the brain regions. So in this case, we've really talked about just the thalamus and the primary somatosensory cortex. They're really not all that's involved with touch, as we are gonna we have those those association areas and so forth. But for now. That's where we're leaving this. And we've talked about what this gives us as far as perception of perceiving the details of objects, uh, vibration, which can tell us about detail and, and texture, and then also how we perceive objects and figure out what objects are when we are um, getting that information from our sense of touch. Uh, I kind of, I want to um, apologize a bit. So to my honors class, as I am not going to, create all of these slides uh, for two different classes when we're talking about the same information. This is a lot of work. <laughs> this is a lot of time. And um, I have two other classes that are different from each other that, that take me some time as well. Uh, so uh, I talk about this as happening on Monday and Wednesday. Honors folks, this is Tuesday, Thursday. So we'll talk about pain on, on Tuesday. And um, the last thing I really just want to for my uh, larger class, I, I have really enjoyed, I loved reading the picking apart the auditory scene discussion. I wrote down every single person's name, last name, and then the music that you gave me. I've only listened to mm, about a quarter of the music that I hadn't heard before. I did not go and count. I really meant to go and count before um, doing this, but I think the winner for the artists that, are, that were most talked about was the Beatles. I'm not completely sure. Uh, Billy Joel was pretty high up there. Uh, okay, uh, I think those were the two that I saw the most. I have I've really enjoyed and loved reading those. And I've, if you notice, things that take a long time to grade are the things that I'm grading as I'm very slow. And you can tell why now since I'm sitting there writing down all the music. But I love uh, discovering new music, which was, was, was just really, really fun for me. So um, you all have a wonderful weekend. Uh, stay safe. Uh, I hope everyone is doing well with everything changing the way it has and uh, take care.